yes, yes. Uh, okay, so let's start. Um, well, welcome uh, everyone uh, to the session uh, on reproducibility in, in HPC. Um, as we all know that uh, you know, the integrity of our scientific enterprise uh, is very much grounded in assumptions of rigor and transparency on, uh, on, on our uh, transparency in our efforts. Um, and uh, recently computational reproducibility uh, has been of high interest to the community because of uh, you know, several papers being published, which uh, you know, the results of which cannot be verified instantly or you know, within a period of time. Uh, and and uh, there's a huge effort with respect to how uh, computational experiments can be made uh, reproducible. Uh, so we have in this session, uh, three outstanding experts in uh, HPC who have been working in the area of computational reproducibility. Uh, and they will tell us as to what is the current state of the art and how we can take it, take it further. Um, so uh, we'll begin with Todd uh, and then Kate and then uh, Andrew. So over to you, Todd. Okay, let me start here. Can you see? <coughs> Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Let me yeah. get a little larger. Okay. So I think I, I thought I would start by giving sort of a general overview of reproducible builds in, in the broader community and then also within HPC. Um, folks may have heard of reproduciblebuilds.org. Um, it's it's a an organization started by a bunch of Linux distro folks. Um, who wanted to make all the packages in, in the distributions reproducible at the binary level. And so their goals with this were to ensure the security of the compilation process. So it's not really a scientific goal. Um, they just wanna ensure that nothing malicious was introduced during builds for, for binary packages. And I mean, this has been a problem for distros because you get say an RPM or some other type of package and you don't really know that it corresponds to a particular source. You, it, it comes from some build farm and the, the question was, what happens if the build farm gets compromised? Um, and so what they do is they, they are very focused on making build recipes for lots of different projects deterministic, um, which enables you to sort of verify that um, a final build artifact corresponds to a particular source. And so and the goal with this is ultimately that a set of trusted maintainers could um, you know, verify that a particular binary with a particular shot actually did come from some source if, if a build farm was compromised. There's, there's all sorts of questions about how to scale this um, and you know, how, how you would actually implement it in practice. But so far, I mean, it's been going well. If you look at Debian, um, most of the builds in the Debian repo are actually reproducible. So you know, any maintainer of the project could go and rebuild some of the standard Debian packages, um, you know, most of them, except for this orange part, um, and you know, get the exact same results that are in production. So I think this is an interesting project um, because it's it's sort of related to what we care about in science, but it, for an entirely different set of goals. Um, there are folks in the scientific community who are looking at this as well. And so the Geeks project, um, which is it's another distribution, um, it's, it's related to Nix, but it's sort of the free software version of Nix. Um, these guys tried to look at what uh, modern ML installations uh, were comprised of. And so they got into it with, with PyTorch. And, and what they found was that, you know, if, if you just try to install PyTorch from pip, um, you get a whole lot of unverifiable binary wheels. And wheels are the Python uh, binary format. Um, from, from the Python package index actually lets anyone submit binaries and and the whole thing is pretty opaque if you install uh, pytorch from a wheel you don't get the source you don't get something that you could reproduce or modify pytorch with you get sort of a binary that someone produced and there is no sort of provenance back to it where it came from um conda forge is a little better um and if people have heard of conda forge it's another package manager it's a it's a binary system 
um, they have an open build farm that leverages public services. And so you can actually look at the build. Um, you can probably reproduce it on GitHub, but it's hard to reproduce outside of its own environment. And the tool itself is sort of binary only. So if you install things from Conda, um, you still just get the binary. It's hard. It would be hard to modify that thing to, you know, to produce, say, a slightly different version of it. Um, Geeks itself is very reproducible. It allows everything to build to be built from from glibc up to the PyTorch level. And I think if you look at distributions like Geeks and Nix, um, the, it really gets to the heart of of why it is so hard to reproduce software experiments, um, especially in HPC. Um, if you want a fully reproducible environment, you really need to build everything up, up from the very bottom of the stack. And so Geeks and Nix build glibc and everything on top of it. So it's a completely isolated environment, kind of like a container, um, but, but all built from their source. Um, it's very deterministic, but it does require you to build everything with Geeks, and that's not for everyone. Um, if you look at package managers um, like these, they, they are built on some key assumptions that I don't think are really compatible with HPC. Um, so in all of this sort of binary reproducibility um, you know, discussion, um, there's this assumption that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the source code and, and the binary. And, and so for a given package, um, there's sort of this assumption that there's a canonical package for it, that, that you can download the Debian package for that thing, that you can verify the path from the source to the binary and that that's enough. Um, there's also this notion that the binaries are supposed to be as portable as possible, sorry for the typo, um, but, but in HPC, that really impacts performance. And, and in, you know, if you don't want your problem to take millennia to run, um, you probably don't want to build the portable version of the binary. You want to build something that's actually optimized for a machine. Um, and there's also an assumption that the tool chain is the same across the ecosystem. So in most of these you know, systems that have looked at reproducible builds, um, there's one compiler and one set of runtime libraries that's on the system. And they sort of assume that that's what you need. Um, and, and that that's what you're going to build with. Um, but it's not really flexible enough for HPC where we want to do experiments. Um, if you actually look at reproducibility in HPC, I don't know what, there we go. Um, the, the builds are changing all the time. Um, the code's distributed as source. It's not really distributed as binaries, at least not at the moment. Um, you build lots of different variants of the same package. Um, because developers need to experiment with what's there. Um, and the code's optimized for you know, the specific processor and GPU. Um, you rely on system libraries, which is actually not great for reproducibility because there's a whole lot of proprietary vendor stuff in your typical HPC stack. And that stuff you only get a binary for. And so oftentimes in HPC, you're, you're not just trying to reproduce you know, something that you have the source for, you're trying to reproduce something that you have some of the source for with libraries that are on sort of the same machine as the person you got the code from. So, um, or you may be trying to do functional reproducibility where you're trying to reproduce the set, you're trying to get the same results, but maybe with different math libraries or a different MPI. Um, and then in HPC, we have lots of different languages, which, which complicates things because the interoperability between these things, the versioning across systems is, is pretty complex. Um, so, you know, both the build and the hardware can affect results on HPC. So I think, you know, it is, it is a very hard problem to talk about reproducibility in HPC um, in, in a general way, just because the platforms are so diverse and the software stacks are so diverse. So there, there were likely to be changes between, you know, any two builds that, that two people do in, in HPC. And, and we'd like to, to solve that problem. Um, so like I was saying, there, there are different kinds of reproducibility for HPC. I look at it this way, where you, know, you, you have this exact notion of um, reproducibility where you have the same code, you have the exact same dependencies, and you have the same machine. Um, and you know, this is useful, but it's, not, uh, I, it's, it's good for verifying a single experiment, but it's not necessarily good for sort of carrying work forward across different generations of HPC machines. So if you get you know, the code from some paper, um, and you have your own HPC center and they had theirs, you're, you're likely not to have the same machine or even necessarily the same architecture as what they built on. Um, and you may want to verify if you're going to do, say, a performance improvement or something like that, that you, know, the, that you get the same results that they did, um, but you're not going to do it in the same environment. You're not going to do it this way. You're, what you're likely to do is to try to do functional reproducibility, which where, where you, say, take the same code, um, you run it on a different machine, and, and you maybe have different dependencies. You might build with a different MPI. Um, and then you're probably going to move on to some sort of experimental mode of interacting with the code where you actually want to modify it. Um, you may change an algorithm and you might want to test whether it gets the same result and whether it gets better performance as something prior. Um, and again, you may have a different machine and different dependencies. 
So, you know, bitwise verification, which seems to be the focus out in industry and in the cloud where, where the, you know, the architectures are pretty homogenous. It's mostly x86, mostly, you know, non-optimized binaries. Um, there's no room for performance improvements here, and there's no room for you know, new machines and different stacks. Um, and it's, it's unlikely for any sort of numerical reproduction to be bitwise reproducible, reproducible, at least at the result level on any parallel machine. So, you know, things like reductions and, and so on, like you're not going to get bitwise same um, floating point results. You need tolerances and regression tests to really verify that this stuff is, is working. So I think, you know, the, the main focus in HPC is on functional reproducibility. It's on, um, you know, whether we get the same results as a prior experiment, not necessarily in, in on this exact regime. Um, and I think that's the case, you know, in a lot of domains, um, if you do want to modify what you what you got from someone else, I think there's a really strong desire to sort of build on prior research that, that hasn't been investigated here, where, you know, it's, it's assumed that if you can reproduce the work that you can then go and change it. And I think those are actually two different things that you have to think of in separate contexts. Um, so I work on SPAC. Um, it's, it's a software distribution tool for HPC. Um, it's, it's built from the start as a from source package manager so that you could go and, and, and modify something that you got from someone else. You, you, will always, you, will, you will have the source at least for the components where source is available in your build. Um, it, it was designed to be flexible. And so you know, the, there's no one HDF5 build in SPAC. You may install HDF5 in a particular version with a different compiler, with different build options, with different flags injected and so on. And you may you know, rely on different versions of different dependencies in, in, the, uh, in the stack. Um, it has some support for provisioning things so that you can use it to, to provision um, an HPC system. But really here, um, we're, we're focusing on sort of the, the scientist use case where you're taking something you got from someone else and trying to reproduce it um, yourself sort of in your home directory. So we're, we're trying to provide the ease of use of mainstream package managers, but with more flexibility so that you could tweak um, a configuration that you got from someone else. Um, it's used widely. I don't think I need to get too far into this, but you know, there's about 5,800 software recipes in SPAC um, that, you know, that provide some degree of reproducibility for HPC. Um, and, and there's a lot of contributors working on them all the time. And, and to some extent that detracts from reproducibility because the stack moves forward so fast. Um, if you look at a SPAC package, they are, they are templated and they use a really simple Python DSL to describe how to build. So like this is the, the file for CryptKey, which is, you know, they use a CMake to build. You can get the source from here. There are actual SHAs to verify the source that you get. Um, and then there are options down here. So really the this, this stuff up here is describing the space of things that you can build with this package. Um, so, um, you know, you can, you can build the same version as someone else but you may build it with OpenMP instead of MPI. Um, or you may use, say, a different CMake version on your machine um, than what someone else built if you just say SPAC install, H or SPAC install CryptKey. Um, there's build recipes in here, and they're, again, templated. They use these parameters. Essentially, we take some subset of, these, uh, of, the, uh, of this configuration up here, of this space, um, and we build one instance of it. And so what that looks like is really like this. If you say, hey, SPAC install this thing, um, with these options, it's it's an abstract description of what you want to install. So you could think of it as sort of a, a functional description of, of what you want. It's it's the requirements. It's not implementation details. It's not the fully specified set of options for every package. It's what you need to reproduce a particular experiment on a machine, or at least what the the user thought you needed to reproduce that experiment. So SPAC takes this, it, it puts it into sort of an abstract spec. Um, where it's partially constrained. And we have an algorithm in SPAC that uses solvers to go and fill in um, sort of all the missing details here. And what you come out with is what we call a concrete spec. And um, we store all the provenance for that on the machine so that you could reproduce this build exactly. You get everything down to you know, the, all of these dependency libraries, you get their compiler configuration, their flags and so on. Um, and another user could take this spec over here and, and reproduce that thing exactly. Um, we allow for arbitrarily many package configurations to be installed, so it's easy to compare. If you take that whole um, set of provenance back installs into lots of different directories, um, one per package, so you can have sort of infinitely many configurations of those things, um, which is good for comparing. You can actually diff the configurations in SPAC to see what was different about two builds, which I think is, is important um, because it's, you know, again, it's not exact reproducibility, but it lets you understand what happened between two different builds. Um, and 
recently we've we've started looking at how we can enable that sort of um, I guess experimental reproducibility in SPAC. Um, we, we're, we've been looking at developer workflows and how we can integrate them into the package management process. Um, we, it was designed really with reproducible deployment in mind, um, and you know developer workflows were not specifically supported. Um, and we needed ways to build on a prior build. We want to reproduce a prior build, and we want to go and start working on it again um, to, to make changes and, and see, you know, if, if we can do things better than they did before, or or do or do another experiment. And I mean, this is this is fundamental to science. If if you, um, it's it's not just that you can reproduce a prior experiment; it's that you can reproduce it and be confident that your changes are, you know, building on the prior experiment in a controlled way. So that's that's really what we're going for here, and I think that's that's fundamental both to science and to developer workflows. Um, we're working on codes like Marble at, at Livermore. Um, this is one of our multi-physics codes. It has about fifty different dependencies and growing, and so you can see that you know there's a whole lot of of complexity in here in terms of the number of packages that we are trying to support. Um, and you know this this is a problem that comes up in industry too. Um, there are systems like Basil. There are systems like um, Buck at, at uh, Facebook and Pants at Twitter. Um, that are designed to version, you know, one running version of this stuff um, in, in a single repo, and they call those mono repo systems. And I think if you talk to people in industry, that's sort of their solution. They say, okay, throw it all in a repo, throw all your configuration in there, and manage um, the, the whole code as one thing moving over time. Um, I think the scientific community and HPC in particular are more distributed that, than that. And so what we're really trying to do here is enable this kind of reproducible developer workflow in an environment where, you know, you, you have to pull from a lot of different repositories. You can't just version everything yourself because the one version of code moving over time isn't going to work on all the platforms that you care about. And the system um, used to build that, like Basil, is it, th those have been extremely hard to get working in sort of non-Google environments or non-vanilla you know vanilla cloud environments. Um, when we go to work on these, you know, large hardware uh, HPC systems, there are many more complexities to the build that come up um, that we have to reproduce than than what we can get out of a typical mono repo system. So we have this ab abstraction called environments in SPAC that we're we're trying to use uh, to enable reproducibility for um, developers. And essentially, what you do is it, it's a file format that specifies, you know, what is needed for a particular build. So that spec I showed on the command line before, we've sort of stuck a bunch of those in a single file. We've included a bunch of configuration with that. Um, and you get this single manifest file that you can use to reproduce a build. And so you might say, I want to install HDF5 libelf and open MPI. Um, when you concretize this thing, um, spec says, OK, I have to build these things on this system. It spits out a, a, what we call a lock file um, that pins all of the versions and configuration options of those things. Um, for that particular build. And you can take this thing and you can use it for that exact reproducibility um, case. Um, and you could make maybe several of them. You might tweak the options up here and make two different lock files for two different configurations of the code. Um, you could basically, this, this represents one build um, that you can then go and reproduce. Um, we are trying to, we, we've used that with some success in, in, in teams using sort of ML tools. Um, so we had a team um, looking to integrate uh, PyTorch with some Livermore uh, multi-physics codes on PowerPC64 systems with the system MPI. And so, you know, before SPAC, everybody built from scratch and they, they spent days trying to debug build differences. Um, now they can actually take this manifest and they can set up a reproducibility, reproducible but also customizable environment in about 20 minutes. Um, they, we cache some of the builds here um, for the machine. The teams sort of share the, the build cache, and they can go in here and tweak compiler settings and, and versions. Um, and sort of it's all controlled with the recipes that I showed earlier and this sort of top level um, YAML manifest. Um, we've added features to SPAC that let developers work on several packages at once to sort of support these kinds of workflows. So you can, so you say, activate this environment with this particular YAML file. You can uh, put an application in your in your environment, and you can say, "I want to develop particular components of it." So, if the application depends on, say, the Axum and MFM libraries, you can say, "I want to develop those," um, and you get a source directory that you can then go and tweak um, and rebuild the whole thing with all of the settings from the lock file, um, but with your modifications from your local source directory. And so, what we're trying to do right now is get our code teams to use this workflow. Um, We've added some Git versioning to it and to, to support that. And, and so this is what the configuration for Marble and SPAC now looks like. 
and I mean, this, this may seem long, but consider that it's a code with like 50 different dependencies. Um, you write down sort of the, um, the, the, the code names, um, the versions of them that you want. Um, if you want to pin the versions, some of them can be left flexible. You write down the compiler settings and you write down system libraries that you want to depend on um, from, from the actual machine itself. Um, and then, you know, this is reproducible at least on the same machine with the same paths to things like CUDA and um, other and CMake and so on. Um, you can remove all of these external packages and have SPAC build them. Um, so it could build the whole stack itself. But this is this also allows us to reproduce sort of those pesky proprietary pieces that are on the HPC machine itself as well. Um, and we generate a lock file for that um, that actually lets us reproduce that, that large physics code. Um, the developers are able to basically check the whole thing out, um, activate a couple packages, and they can work in these sort of subdirectories of the larger environment with a manifest and a lock file. And, and what we're working on right now is sort of improving this workflow over time. Um, I guess what we don't really have yet um, is the, the ability to reason about all of the different aspects of the configuration. And so, you know, right now we rely a lot on humans to, to generate the package recipes. And yeah, they're templated um, and, and humans provide things like version ranges and conflicts and so on that, that say, how should a particular configuration be resolved by the package manager? And they get it wrong. So, you know, if, if you are trying to um, maintain something like this over time, um, this is the weakest link right here. People introduce errors into this configuration. Um, we're trying to build techniques on a research project at Livermore that, that we kicked off uh, this past year um, to get rid of some of these human generated constraints and replace them with actual models of ABI compatibility. So we would go and analyze the binaries, say, on the system. We'd be able to say, oh, that's, you know, Zlib version whatever that happens to be on the system. And to interact with that, or to reproduce something functionally with that particular library, we would have to build all these other components around it with, with particular versions and configurations of their own. Um, we run that through a solver and we get this ABI compatible graph. What we would really like to be able to do um, is to allow a user to take one of these sort of descriptions of a past build, like a lock file, and say, you know, I, I think that I want to build this with a different MPI, or I want to change the numerical libraries that, we, that it used. I want to I want to change certain parameters there and solve as closely as possible to the prior build. Um, and so we think we can enable that with the solvers that we have right now, but that, that's what we're working towards. And I think if that's possible, then you can really start to um, get some guarantees out of your build system about whether you really are getting the same thing, modulo your changes as what you had before. Um, and so um, that's where we're at right now. So thanks, and uh, any questions? Questions? Hey, hey Todd. I, I had one. Um, I, I know you've been working a lot on the concretizer uh, yeah. recently. And so I'm curious if you could just speak quickly to how reproducibility is impacted if and when SPAC's con concretizer or solver changes. I think you answered this partially that there's like a definite spec that you can work with, but I, I'm just kind of curious what, what one should expect in terms of reproducibility as you know, the concretizer, I think, uh, evolves. Yeah, so I mean, if it, it, there's two levels, right? You, you have, um, let me go back to this picture. You've got your YAML file, which is sort of your functional requirements up here. And that gets run through the solver to produce this lock file. So if you want to reproduce a lock file, you're not actually, the, the tool's not doing any inference. You have a complete description of the provenance of the prior build. And so this is where you can reproduce stuff exactly. You're not, you're not doing the solve, except for to help the user initially. And then um, if you want to reproduce exactly, you have this lock file. What we've run into is that if you want to do functional reproducibility, there's some reasoning that you need to apply to the problem to get it to run on a different system, right? You have to make changes. And I think that's where people get hung up um, is because ports are hard. Right, and so what we're envisioning is that you know, right now, yeah, if you just reproduce and hand someone a, a spac.yaml, it's going to solve again on their system, and you're going to get a slightly different build. If you hand them the lock file, you'll get the same thing. Um, what we have trouble with is hand them the lock file and say build something as close as possible to that on a new machine. And so I think there there could be another step here where you take the solver and apply it again with some new constraints and and try to stick as closely as possible to this old build. So that that's where we're 
the, do you see, do those yeah. two levels make sense? So, so if I'm trying to build on, let's just say some different resource, I could, I would need both of these files to sort of rationalize what bits have changed for that um, experimental level of reproducibility. You can diff two lock files. So you can take yeah. just the lock file and you can say what's, what's different about these two builds. And we have commands to do that. So we can show you what's different about the configuration. Great, thanks. So Todd, since we are on this uh, slide, actually I had a question more basic than what Andrew asked. Uh, I, I thought that the user is giving partial specification Yep. which would generate multiple lock files. You can, yeah. Uh, so, so how do you choose, like, you know, which one is the one that would be compatible with the new environment? You don't, you don't know. So, I mean, I, I think that's, it, that's, that's one of the hard problems, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you, I mean, so suppose that you said you needed, I don't know, HDF5 with say C++ support um, mm -hmm. with that particular interface. And then you, HDF5 requires say C++ 17, but the environment you're trying to reproduce that in doesn't support it. Um, it'll just come back and say, I can't do that, right? It, it has a hard constraint on that thing from the prior environment. What, what we would like to do is to have the solver actually tell you that and say, you know, hey, the, I could build on this, but I'm gonna have to change these five settings and here's what you get. This is as close as I can get to the other thing. And here's what I modified to make it possible. Um, and I think that's that's the hard part, and that, that's what where the solvers can help. But it's also the research part. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, especially with you know things with the LLVM tool chain. Yep. If, if one is working with that, I mean, you know, all bets are off. <laughs> like, right. Every version changes, and yeah, it's a mess. So. Well, and I mean, we can reproduce. I mean, we can rebuild LLVM too. That, that's the other, the, if you think about the things that SPAC can build right now, it does not go as far down as say Nix and Geeks, um, which go down to glibc, but we can rebuild LLVM for you. And so you could have a reproducible build of the LLVM compiler itself. And we can save binary caches of that stuff that are reproducible across platforms. So, so there is that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but yeah, I agree. I mean, like it, it seems like reproducibility is really about understanding how to exist in a very rapidly changing set of software versions, right? Like, I mean, that's I think that's, true. yeah. That's true, that's true. Uh, any more questions? Uh, this is this is fantastic. Uh, I have a, a quick comment. So I think that, you know, one of the, the models that is my hand about reproducibility, my head in, uh, uh, about reproducibility is really the, the, um, ex like ways, you know, so 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 really strict reproducibility is actually only possible for a very short amount of time, right? Yeah. Especially in these these environments, like computational environments. And 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 actually being able to extend that to like even two years is challenging. Um, and so and we have already challenges simply by you know how devices age um, uh, that make you know reproducibility challenging. Some of the devices age faster than others. Um, so at least this, 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 these research questions hopefully will lead to at least in one dimension, having a little larger window for producibility in this, uh, quickly changing environment where, you know, the goals of reproducibility, um, are, are sort of different, right? There's like, on one hand, you have like, yeah, you want to have a particular claim reproduced, but on the other hand, you have maybe the, the wider sense of reproducibility where you want to just reuse some, you want to demonstrate an experiment in a classroom and you don't want to like spend months to reconstruct that experiment, but to just be able to um, to demonstrate it or have students work on it and, and, and look at, 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 play with it. And so I think, you know, that's where, where the current infrastructure really breaks down, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, things change and then all these things stop working. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think to some extent, the real notion of reproducibility is you, you write a test for it and you make sure it keeps working in CI. <laughs> and I mean, that's the, it, so, I mean, that, that's not super satisfying from a, you know, a formal perspective, right? Because I think that you, you, you would think that you could do something stronger than that, but it, that's, that's actually what we've ended up doing 
for code teams at Livermore is, is we've, we've just put the builds that they rely on into CI and production stack. So that if, if PRs come in and change versions of things that we ensure that at least that the builds that we care about keep working. Um, we're trying to expand that. So it, it's, it's very hard to do this stuff without a bunch of testing and, um, and, and continuous integration as well. Okay, uh, thanks Todd uh, so much. Uh, and, and the session is being recorded, which is fantastic. So we can all go back and uh, listen at leisure to what Todd, Todd mentioned there. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, let's move on to Kate. Um, uh, Here Kate, I am. Yes. I'm okay. going to share. And let's see, can you see this? Yes. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Right, so this is going to be a little bit of a change of pace. Um, and, and as Todd mentioned, um, there, there are different flavors of reproducibility that you can think of. And I think that I'm going to be a little bit more on the exact reproducibility uh, side of things. And, and um, what we're dealing with is a practical reproducibility, right? So let's get things in the hands of users and, and have them use that in practice. And the reason I'm interested in that is because I'm the PI of a project called Chameleon, which is a, a test bed for computer science research, right? So a, a special kind of test bed, I will explain how this is special, but first, uh, but first what do we want to do with practical reproducibility, right? So today, when I am entering a new research area, I go and read up on, on that research area and I read various papers, but I don't go and uh, play with the experiments that people published in those papers. I, I don't do that. Why not? Can we do that, right? Can we um, give facilities to reviewers of a conference so that they can replay the experiments quite easily, right? Can I take somebody else's experiment and modify it, modify it and come up with a new result? or? Can I work with students and have them reproduce experiments from the latest conference easily, right? So the, um, uh, there is, a, there is a, a concept that people have been thinking a long time uh, about, you know, I'm reading a paper on the iPad, I see a graph, I click on it, and it takes me someplace where I can actually play with those results, right? Re-engineer re data analysis, perhaps to some extent, or replay this experiment. And with this particular paper, you actually can, because we've got facilities on Chameleon right now that enable that, right? So, so one point that I'm trying to make, that the existence of a, of a powerful open testbed is a fundamental requirement for practical reproducibility. And I'll, I'll expand on that later, but first let me tell you about that testbed. So Chameleon in a nutshell, Chameleon, everybody knows, they like to change. So this is a testbed that is engineered to adapt itself to your experimental needs, right? So we support deeper configurability at bare metal level. Uh, you, you come and you choose the machines that you want to um, work on and, and uh, you can reconfigure them and you get sole ownership of them, single tenancy and all that. We do have a smaller KVM cloud as well, but uh, mostly we have bare metal machines and with those machines you can reboot them, you can boot them from custom kernel, get serial console access and so forth and so on. So you can actually get access to the same hardware that somebody did their experiment on, configured in exactly the same way, right? Um, secondly, we are trying to be as large scale um, as we can. And in fact, the main two sites of Chameleon are at University of Chicago and TAG. The University of Chicago hardware is actually in AL, uh, ALCF. So you've got two supercomputing centers connected by a 100G network. Um, we support experimentation with big compute. Uh, largest size partition that we have is 15,000 cores, which is not huge, but um, sufficient for the, uh, the needs of our users. Uh, we've got lots of storage in various different configurations that you can experiment with. Um, and we also have a diverse hardware, right? So all uh, atoms, arms, FPGAs, uh, lots of different GPU clusters and interesting networking hardware uh, as well. And we are now, uh, our partners are configuring uh, their own uh, chameleon sites. So the test bed is going to be growing. 
Chameleon is a little bit unique relative to test beds that came before it because it's configured with mainstream cloud technology called OpenStack, right? So we extended it in, you know, it's it's about 50% of everything that's going on at the test bed, but uh, being built on, on open source, mainstream open source uh, is of great advantage, of course. And, and um, you know, noticing that many of our users want to share results, we also provide facilities for uh, reproducibility and sharing. Um, uh, Chameleon in numbers, we've served over 6,000 users over um, across the, uh, at this point, more than six years that we've been in operation, 750 projects, uh, people published uh, uh, more than 400 papers uh, using the testbed. And so um, why do I say that testbed are a, a fundamental element of reproducibility? Uh, for one thing, they create a reproducibility baseline, right? So Todd explained that in order to, for the, uh, for the exact reproducibility, you would have to run something on the same hardware that somebody created that on in the first place. And test beds give you that, right? It doesn't have to be the exact same hardware, although it could, on Chameleon it definitely could, but it could be the same type of hardware, right? So this sort of democratizes research, makes sure that if you need a cluster of GPUs, you don't have to uh, work at a supercomputing center. Uh, that cluster of GPUs is available to everybody. And to make it easier, we also version the hardware, right? So yes, we do have the problem with device versions, but at least if we you know, upgrade memory or change the disk on the nodes, you're gonna know about it because it's gonna be different hardware version. And expressive allocation, what I mean by that is you can um, allocate a specific node Right for, for our users who experiment with things like performance variability or power management, this is very important. Secondly, the sharing is via cloud pattern, right? So this bare metal reconfiguration chameleons operated using OpenStack cloud. Um, this this uh, sort of thing happens really when you go to any cloud, right? So it's no longer the case that you're executing either on your laptop or um, uh, on a machine in a lab that a system administrator configured for you. And you may not know exactly what that environment contained, right? When you go to a cloud, you have to bring an image with you and you deploy it on the cloud. So all your environmental dependencies are, are nicely saved, nicely encapsulated in that image, right? So just by doing that, you making a big step towards making uh, your experiments repeatable, just using clouds, right? We haven't done anything special yet. We're just using clouds the way they're supposed to be used. Furthermore, um, there's something called orchestration, right? So if you use Amazon, that's that's cloud formation. Uh, on OpenStack, that's called heat. Uh, you can use those orchestration templates and you can define very complex deployments, uh, virtual clusters or things like that in those templates. And then that deployment is repeatable as well. Right? And, and users use those things. On Chameleon, they created thousands of images and, and orchestration templates. And all that needs to be done really is label them as something as a dependency of an experiment that somebody could leverage. Right? So you can think of a testbed as a, as a player for predefined environments. And those environments, again, you don't do anything special to define them. You just use clouds as, as they're supposed to be used. And I explained more about this in a, in a paper. So what is missing? So we've got really two roles from the, from the perspective of somebody who's repeating research, what is missing is packaging of experiment that would be complete, right? So not just the hardware, not just the environment, but also everything that you run as part of your experiment. And it should have various properties. I won't go into them uh, uh, right now. We can maybe follow that uh, on that later in discussion, but one very important property is that it should be integrated, right? So it has everything together and not just everything together, but also how those things connect to each other. And this is really a paradigm that, that Donald Knuth came up with and it's called literate programming. And a, a nice implementation of literate programming that happens to be open source is provided by the Jupyter project these days. And it's deservedly very popular with scientific uh, projects that um, uh, do complex things and want to provide reproducibility. So one thing is you need to package those experiments in some way. Second thing, you need to get access for, for reproducibility, right? So it's, it's not enough to have the package. You somehow 
need, need a platform on which to execute. And finally, you need to discover those experiments through various channels, right? So through the paper, uh, like I showed at the beginning is one way, but maybe you want to just go off and say, geez, you know, I'm looking for a machine learning model uh, for data with some special characteristics that did anybody do that? Right? And you may want to browse and, um, and, and play with that. So this is from the perspective of somebody who's repeating the experiment. Now, from somebody who's packaging the experiment, um, you need to package the experiment in such a way that users like it. So, right? so all, the, all the properties that you have on the left, but there's another property that, that from the uh, perspective of the provider is very important, which is that it's cost effective, right? preferably as a, as a side effect of something that you're already doing. Right, so all these um, images, uh, environments uh, available via images, that's a very good thing. You need to be able to give users access for reproducibility of, of your experiments. And then you need to be able to share the work in progress with your collaborators, perhaps. And when you're done, you need some way to publish that digital artifact that is your experiment. Right. So, so in Chameleon, we decided to make it easy for users, right? Leverage the fact that we already have a platform, that we already have all those thousands of environments available for use. And we defined uh, uh, three groups of services. One that helps the users package their experiment, one that helps them get or give access, and, and then another one that um, helps them to share their work with others. And the, here there are in turn, right? So packaging shareable experiments. I already said literate programming. Uh, Jupyter provides a fantastic implementation of that. But from the perspective of our users, Jupyter has, has one shortcoming, right? And that shortcoming is that um, when you write your experiment in, in those Jupyter cells, um, at the back end, they get executed in a Docker container, right? And that's, um, that's not what our users want, right? So our users create experiments that are distributed. Here's, a, here's an example of an experimental configuration. And you've got you know, two network circuits, multiple switches, multiple nodes distributed um, over, over the whole test bed, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a long way from a, a Docker container. So what we did in order to make it easy for our users to um, uh, do configure reproducible experiments on Chameleon, is we integrated Jupyter with Chameleon in such a way that your Chameleon credentials are implicit in the Jupyter code cells, and you can create those complex environments from your notebook. And there's a little video that shows you um, the story of one experiment, uh, obviously somewhat dated from, from three years ago, uh, but there is uh, also a paper that describes how to do that. All right, so now you have a, a complete and integrated packaging of an experiment. So now, you'd like to do what I showed at the beginning, right? You'd like to say, click here to reproduce this experiment. And in that paper, if you click, it will um, take you to Chameleon and will say, request Chameleon Day Pass. And, and you can do that. You can request the, uh, the author from the author of the experiment, a day pass uh, um, uh, allocation on Chameleon for a short time in purpose to reproduce this specific experiment. And if you reproduce it, and you like it, you can always go and, and create your own uh, Chameleon project, right? So this is just something to make it easier, make it streamlined for people uh, to get access for the purpose of reproducing, right? If I'm sitting there with my iPad, I want to click and I want to be just a few clicks away from actually being able to play with the data in the Jupyter Notebook or actually being able to rerun that experiment. And then last but not least, how do we find those experiments? So the, the, the current experimental ecosystem right, relies on us publishing papers, and those papers get collected in something like proceedings, they get put in libraries, and then you've got some indexing system for uh, figuring out how to find uh, what you want. For digital artifacts, it's a little bit different. And, and one of the reasons for why it's a little bit different is that uh, when I read the paper, um, I don't really need some extra help to, to read the paper, right? I just am fully equipped to do that. Um, for experiments or digital artifacts that are zeros and ones, 
we need a little bit of help, right? So we need a player for those things. And it's it's kind of similar really to the traditional libraries, right? If instead of uh, proceedings, you checked out a, a microfilm, the library is likely to provide a reader for that microfilm, right? So um, test beds or, or libraries for digital artifacts have to include something that will allow you to interpret or to read those artifacts, right? Like Chameleon or like other clouds or test beds, um, uh, that that you need for various specific topics. So the first thing we did is we integrated with Zenodo, which is a, a fabulous digital publishing platform developed at CERN. And what Zenodo allows you to do is it gives you uh, digital object identifiers for your experiments. Then you can cite your experiment from your paper and, and make it available in this way, right? What you can also do is you can go to Zenodo and import the experiments that were already published by Zenodo into Chameleon, represent it as, as, as a Jupyter notebook and um, uh, try to run it on Chameleon resources. Not all of them were obviously packaged with Chameleon, so a, a little bit of tweaking sometimes might be required. But what our users told us is that this is all well and good, but when they want to share experiments, they are not always um, ready to publish them, right? They are, they are not, always ready for that DOI. So uh, they want to share some intermediate results with collaborators, work with them on some sort of um, work in progress. So for them, we created Trovi, which is integrated with Chameleon, which is for that temporary work in progress, right? So it has, it has bins where you put all the artifacts that are connected to an experiment. You can do fine grain sharing of those bins. So it's not like, you know, when you publish, it's all publicly available and just share with your collaborators and provides versioning as well. And we integrated it with our portal. So you can go to the portal, you can filter the experiment, you can search by keyword, by tag and things like that. And you can find something interesting. Um, and then we integrated it with, with uh, Jupyter uh, as well. We integrated with Swift, which is um, the, um, the OpenStack object store that, that we run. And we are currently in the process of integrating that with GitHub since many of our users use that, right? So being able to import and export, go between GitHub and Chameleon uh, is a good thing, right? And then we might not provide fine grain sharing via GitHub. Uh, that would be via Swift, but you can always import to Swift. So a few parting thoughts. Um, again, we kind of think that test beds are the, the fundamental player that you need for experiments. It's important to have those public resources. Um, they are an instrument held in common in many ways, a baseline for reproducibility, right? Democratizes access to resources. Um, we provide, in order to encourage that, we provide instruments and methods that, that enable this practical flavor of, of reproducibility, and they have to do with packaging access and sharing. And um, the, the potential of this is interesting, right? Because one thing that you can imagine taking place is integration of research and teaching. So one of our, um, one of our colleagues um, actually created a Trovi artifact, which is a packaging of, of a very recent experiment from, from one of his papers. And we um, and he packaged that um, mid-August last year. We just found out recently it's actually one of the most used artifacts uh, on Chameleon that was created was used over 400 times. And it turned out that some people were actually using that for uh, instruction. Right? They had a they had a seminar level class where people were. Uh, reading various papers and they were playing or were trying to play with the experiments in those papers as well. And, and that is um, to me very exciting because I still remember how thrilling it was when in a compilers class, the professor at some point in the second part of the sequence uh, came and brought a bunch of papers on, on compiler optimization and, and said, well, try to try to implement this in your compiler, right? And it makes you feel that, that you're part of an ongoing research, right? That you're part of the research community and contributing to that. So I think that that's huge potential. Uh, the other thing is integration of computer science research into emergent applications. And that was something that actually uh, came through with surprising force 
Uh, Chameleon now has an edge test bed, and we just recently had a, a workshop for that edge test bed where different groups showcased um, their research that they were doing on edge to cloud and computing from edge to cloud. And there was, it's, it's of course, a very emergent direction, but there was huge interest of, oh, can you, can you package that in a Jupyter notebook? Because I would like to use this tool, or I would like to use this method, um, or things like that. So. Um, I think that, um, for, you know, from my perspective, again, the, the practical side of it, maybe not so much for verification as for building your own research and and um, engaging others in uh, creating new research artifacts uh, is important. So that's it. That's that's it from me. Thanks, Kate. Uh, very interesting. I, I would like to comment that, you know, the potential is already being used in the sense that we did use Chameleon. I would like to report to the audience that we used Chameleon uh, as a test bed for artifact description and artifact evaluation at SC21. And uh, I mean, I would say that Chamele we had a choice of quite a few test beds. Chameleon was the one that was most used. Um, not only because of the infrastructure that it provides, I would also say that the usability was was quite high. So, uh, you know, the interfaces that it provided and um, and, 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 and yeah, and and I'm of course delighted that this happened. And I'm going to, if I may, I, I know that I'm here to answer questions now, but I'm going to ask two, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, uh, sure. The, Number one is those those artifacts from supercomputing that were packaged. Um, you know, would it be possible to make them available via Trovi to others? Because again, uh, people could start learning from it and, and they could start building on it. I think that it's a, it's a great opportunity. And, and the second question that I have is, is there a report from, um, from using, um, from, from, from the reproducibility initiative at supercomputing? I was, and I'm just asking because just today in the morning, I was, I was reading one from SOSP. And uh, it's, I, I think it's very valuable to share those insights. Yes. Uh, so answering your second question first, we are working on that report. Uh, we're just not completely done with the process, which is the final badging that's happening right now. Um, but, but the report is, is, in, is in the works and soon, we, very soon we'll, we'll have it. Um, I'm waiting yeah. with bated breath. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have I have some more incentive to finish it. Uh, so 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 that's there. And and with respect to your first question, so the artifacts. So uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that some of the artifacts are going to be archived with the ACM digital library, and we are working on those. The others have uh, most of them have a Zenodo. Uh, sort of they are archived at Zenodo. So um, um, how we can make them more accessible. So we are, we are trying to get all the links and publish them on sysartifacts.github.io. So have the, a listing over there. But ideally, I would like them to be in a, in a more runnable form in the sense all these are static places where you know, the artifacts exist and, uh, you know, somebody has to download them, get them on an infrastructure, and it would be a, a, a more sort of useful thing if they are on a test bed to begin with. Uh, and that is, um, it will require a little bit more effort. Maybe in 2022, we can, we can do that. Uh, have a more formal way of getting the artifacts on, on, on a, or, or keeping yeah. them on the test bed for a longer time. Well, yeah. We should we should perhaps uh, uh, chat uh, maybe in detail maybe later. Um, I I would be very interested in, in advertising them, especially the ones that were already packaged in Chameleon, to the Chameleon user community because I, I know that I mean now that we know that that uh, some of them are really getting traction, I, I think that um, it would be interesting to see what people could do with them. Right, not just uh, have them packaged, get the badge, and run away, but have it actually influence future research and future teaching. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's that's also uh, something that we are very interested, in. and that's that's a section that's that we are going to work on in in the report that how this can help future research and teaching. Uh, 
Um, but I'll open the thing for questions from others. Hey, Kate, that was a great talk. I guess I got a question for you as well as others here. Um, mostly regarding your experience with Zenodo. I've used it a bit, obviously, and um, really like it, but um, it's developed under a European program and run by CERN. And the three of us are sitting here uh, representing DOE labs. So I guess it's an interesting question of, sh is, should OSTI or some other US entity be doing something in this sense? Um, it, should we be, are we right to, to use Zenodo in the way we do? Um, I'm just curious to see what, yeah. what thoughts are here. I, you know, um, I, I think it's a great idea that uh, something like this should probably be created uh, in the US as well. Um, but I think, you know, so uh, I actually talked to the folks who are maintaining Zenodo. They are, you know, they are reasonably well funded at this point. They are really uh, excited about managing it for, you know, all posterity to the extent uh, that it's possible. Um, I, you know, in terms of resources that get used, right? We're, we're, we're using European resources, as you point out. I think it would be fantastic to have uh, something in the US. My personal preference would be to for this thing to be in some way associated with Zanotto, right? I think that they got the ball rolling. I think they got traction. They got many, many artifacts. Um, I think that whatever gets created uh, it, I, I think that at, at this point, it would be beneficial to the user community to maintain compatibility with what's already there, because there is a, a critical mass of content. And it, I think it would be difficult to start completely from scratch. I mean, is there is there a worry that Zenodo is going to go away or something because it's European? I guess I don't, I, I don't fully understand what Andrew's getting at. Well, yeah. they do have a lot of mindshare, right? That's like, part of it. Yep. And it's a big community. So yeah. I, I feel like it's something And, and it's well funded, on. very well funded. Yeah. Good. But, you know, um, I, I think I think that at least part of the concern here is it, it is funded by European Union. Um, are we uh, being a little bit, um, you know, should we contribute to that? Maybe we should fund yeah. some of the right? <laughs> exactly. Or, yeah, I think or, that's, the, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. Or, or maybe we should, maybe we should create a mirror in the U.S. that is, that is also well-funded or in some ways, or, you know, some way of doing that. Should we contribute to that effort? I, I, I completely understand. Yeah. I think actually the, the concept of a mirror is fascinating, right? Um, uh, so we have that discussion right now. It's like, where are these artifacts going to be offered uh, that were produced as part of uh, SC21? And, um, you know, yeah, they're, they're going to be, you know, Zenodo, ACM has some uh, artifacts stored, although that's not clear yet whether that's going to, I mean, they have DOIs, but um, they're not accessible yet. Um, but then, you know, there are other websites, right, that the systems community has created to, to advertise those artifacts at their place. So I think there's, um, I think if we're not careful, there's going to be a, 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 a lot of places where these artifacts are going to be offered, right? And, um, and just mm -hmm. like papers, right, papers are going to also, there's, there are going to be many copies, right? But it would be good to have not too many places. Um, and 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 have places that are trustworthy uh, in some sense, right? For yeah. the same reasons as Todd uh, talked about earlier, um, especially artifacts, right? Papers are kind of, I don't know, maybe there are malicious PDFs, but uh, but artifacts can definitely be malicious, right? And so, um, so I think that uh, 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 I think. You know, and I think then Trove would be a, another good example that could be serving as a mirror, maybe uh, for yeah. you know, and that's it doesn't have to be necessarily the reference of everything, but it could be definitely a example of yeah. the cache, so to speak, right? Well, we're thinking of Trovi. Uh, so actually, um, Trovi, sorry. We, yeah, we we Trovi is fine in in Esperanto. We just wanted to make something where you know, things would be easy to find, experiments would be easy to find. We're actually, we originally 
conceive of this as something specifically tied to the test bed, right? So if you have artifacts on Chameleon, you can replay them on Chameleon. What happened was that now there's this fabric um, networking test bed coming out, and we are talking to them now about how to make it a, a joint repository of, of experiments because, you know, it already exists. We have a very similar approach. You know, they, they are based on OpenStack and, and they also use Jupyter Notebooks. So it, you know, the other parts of the ecosystem are, are compatible with what we're doing. And I think that um, uh, hopefully in the long term, there, there could be an organic trend towards, um, you know, just, just putting things in, in places Again, based on critical mass, putting things in places where people would expect to find them, and when they are tied to to this microfilm reader, right? When they are tied to test beds, they that could um, support reproducing uh, those experiments. But it's this is maybe a, a little bit different than artifacts that are uh, packaged to be generic. And where you know a lot of work and a lot of care has been taken to make it portable between various different platforms and so forth, right? Which um, might not be might not see any particular test bed as its destination. So it's I think it's a very interesting space, and the jury is out on what all the elements of an of a digital publishing ecosystem are going to be, right? We're of course arguing that testbed or some kind of player needs to be included because otherwise you, you get a package that you may not be able to do anything with. Um, but yeah, but, but, but there are other considerations and I think, I think we need to get some things going in practice and see what emerges. Yeah, this is, this is actually, I mean, you know, you end up uh, writing emulators for, you know, for the environment you have now so you can play the artifacts in 10 years from now, right? Yeah. Although, you know, I, I think it was you who mentioned at some point that, um, um, you know, we can we can support right now reproducibility for something like three months or six months or whatever short period of time, right? And um, this also happens to be maybe the most useful reproducibility period because that's when the reviews come in, that's when the result is fresh and so forth. What we're hoping, is that with the with the right packaging and the right tools, some of that short short term period might be leveraged to into incentivizing people to maintain their artifacts for a longer period, right? So so the Linoes artifact on Trovi that I was referring to that was used over four hundred times, it it uh, turned out um, people are you know it, it sort of it went out of date because it's been packaged over a year ago. But the authors are now incentivized. Oh, they are seeing that it's much used. They are incentivized to update it, right? So hopefully we can create such such virtuous circle there. Um, uh, Kate, I actually have a question, uh, mm -hmm. which is on uh, the Jupyter notebooks. So you know, I've recently, you know, in my own project of SciUnit, we have integrated that with Jupyter notebooks because. Uh, they they are the rage amongst scientists. Yeah. So, uh, so and I've been very interested in in this. So, so my question is that, uh, it, and my own sort of experience made me learn that you know it's it's you know the, the Jupyter notebooks are very sensitive to the order in which they are they are played and. And so I, I'm wondering that, you know, do you make any assumptions with respect to the working of the Jupyter notebook when you are distributing them on the Chameleon uh, test bed? Um, so we didn't, we didn't do much on the order, right? We're sort of uh, leaving it to the individual experimenters to manage the order and make sure that they do the right thing. But there is one thing that we have done um, so we got we got a lot of feedback from experimenters that um, you know so so again there's this this Docker container problem right when you when you have a distributed experiment um, you execute on on multiple different instances so we're now in the process of of developing a new Jupyter kernel called Hydra which allows you to bind Jupyter cells to different instances 
of your experiment, right? So if you have a distributed experiment that happens, and especially in networking, but generally in distributed computing, it, it happens a lot um, that you have, inst and, and of course now with edge computing, this is, this is particularly useful where people have edge devices in all sorts of places. Um, you can bind, you can, for example, uh, do your development on um, and, you know, and run the cell on a, a beefy machine or a machine that is easily accessible. And then you can rebind that same cell when you're done with your development onto an edge device, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can do all the development for your experiment locally by binding the cells to one instance. And then you can take one of them and put it on a remote machine, see what happens. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Yes, I've heard about Hydra, um, and uh, I believe that's not proprietary to 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 your group. Uh, uh, no, the... but it's but it's still very much a prototype, right? Because uh, of course, as soon as we as as we did Hydra, uh, people started wanting to use it and started trying it out and started saying, "Oh, can you also do this? And can you also do that?" Right. You know, and yes. and before we know it, we have. Uh, a wish list that essentially, uh, I mean, it's it's almost like developing a new parallel programming paradigm, right? right? And people right. want to run in those uh, different environments at the same time, uh, and what what's happening, right? Yeah, yeah. So, is uh, no, no, that's is, that's an interesting way. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting way. I mean, you know, you still have to rely on the user a little bit so that they they you know there aren't dependencies between the cells and yeah. Uh, yeah, so right, but yeah. The users need to know what they're doing. There's there's right. no question about that. But you know, in our case, this is very often the assumption, right? We work with computer science researchers. Uh, you know, if I think the chameleon would be very difficult to use for domain scientists. And you know, we do support emergent applications, but again, those are emergent applications that are typically worked on by by um groups in domain science that know what they're doing that know how to modify the kernel right and and put from custom kernel and things like that um, so it's you know in many ways it's a fair assumption uh well uh, in the interest of time so thanks thanks yeah. kate and i I'll, I'll just move ahead uh absolutely uh, yes. uh so um andrew is our next speaker uh, uh, and there you go, Andrew. All right. Hopefully you can see some slides now. Yes. All right. So, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Young. Actually, Andrew, maybe you, you need to put it in the view mode. So oh, that... are you guys seeing the different... Uh, well, I'm, we're seeing the... You're, you're not presenting. Presenter. Yeah, presenting, yes. How about now? Yeah, that's there you go. Okay. All right, cool. So I'm going to talk about portability and reproducibility considerations in the context of HPC containers. Um, this is rather interesting sort of uh, relevant topic for us. Uh, I will say in advance, none of this happens in a vacuum or at all just by myself. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is borrowed from um, some work Shane Cannon and I did recently as well as some collaborators at Sandia, specifically Kevin Pedretti, Jay Lofsted, and Cy Hammond. So reproducibility, as we all know, is sort of a cornerstone of quality science. Um, you know, I think it really allows us to answer the, the, the right scientific questions. And we see this directly in the DOE and NNSA in particular, um, where there is this fundamental mission to extend sort of our, our life cycle uh, without underground testing. And so the way we do this obviously is relying on modeling and simulation applications um, heavily. <laughs> uh, there's you know a, a multitude of physics and engineering models built in, and then these the simulation codes uh, execute on leadership class supercomputing resources. The studies which get conducted take years, many many years, to to fully qualify and support um, you know our design decisions here. And in this process, any particular result or simulation um, may not seem important in the time, right? We do large ensembles, thousands and thousands of runs potentially. And later analysis, be it through um, 
VNV or qualification or um, you know uh, surveillance in the field may demonstrate that there's all of a sudden a lot of value in an old simulation. And we need to reproduce and reevaluate these runs months or even many years later. Um, this, is, this is a real challenge that we're starting to address and, and look at significant findings. And so many people have really started uh, asking, can containers help or hinder this sort of process? And, and how can we um, build from this? You know, I'll, I'll state directly, containers alone cannot solve this problem. This is a very, very big and interesting challenge. But the hope is that containers could potentially help encapsulate some of the actual models and simulations that are run. So about containers, there's the super containers effort, for lack of a better term. It's a joint DOE effort that we have that really try to ensure that our container runtimes can be scalable, interoperable, and well integrated across the DOE. Um, you know, looking at anywhere from laptops to exascale deployment, hopefully here soon. Um, and we really want to, ex you know, assist with our, our applications and facilities to be able to leverage containers and HPC container runtimes most efficiently. Uh, this is done through scalable R&D, collaboration, and a series of training and education and support uh, solutions. Uh, we're really interested in portable solutions, um, you know, through, through E4S or other activities, ensuring that they're going to run on some of our leadership class systems. And um, there's a great deal of container runtimes and implementations that exist. We're not really interested in picking a winner or, or a, you know, particularly, uh, you know, setting our sites on only one container runtime, but being able to address multiple facility needs and multiple scales. So it's, it should be no surprise that containerized computing, for lack of a better term, is being adopted across the HPC landscape, both in the DOE and beyond. There's many reasons this is happening, right? There's this model of uh, being able to prescriptively deploy uh, your software ecosystem. That prescription may just be a manifest or a Docker file or container file. This, this um, integrates well with sort of modern DevOps or CI solutions. And there's some notion, at least in the cloud world that we borrow from, in the context of portability. There's also some hope that I could go and dust off my old container from you know, my registry months or years down the line and go and reproduce some workload that I ran. It's a big asterisk there, I think, that we all know and what we're really going to try to address here. And there's an obvious advantage that you can really bring in a wider array of software um, and, and, and sort of define your software ecosystem as you see fit rather than as the vendor or somebody else sees fit. So there's, there's a lot of potential tools and runtimes available today. I won't go too much into that, but really the idea of containers is to ease this sort of barrier for complex or emerging software ecosystems. So containers, you know, promise the potential to improve, improve our flexibility, right? I can, I have these user-defined software stacks, um, but this has an impact on portability and reproducibility as well as performance. Um, you know, and many of our implementations, I think, fall short on delivering on these promises in the context of HPC because we care so much about the P in HPC and that is performance, right? So, you know, we still need to build our containers that match our host microarchitecture. They need to be capable of exploiting uh, the specialized hardware that we're seeing. You know, this includes not only our high speed, low latency interconnects, specialized extensions within CPUs, but a vast and growing array of GPUs and accelerators. Um, and, and our runtimes really need to leverage these different libraries from the host directly in containers to get that, that performance. So there's this fundamental struggle that we see between performance, reproducibility, and portability. And this is, this is not a struggle that we're going to ever solve. I think what, we're, what I'd like to do is at least make this problem um, aware to everybody, right? In that you could really operate on some continuum here and you got to know where you are. Right? Maybe you're interested in really creating a performant, you know, containerized solution, and you're going to target very special um, or custom hardware. You're going to use vendor proprietary software. You're going to build and borrow libraries during, uh, you know, distributed ex execution um, from the host, such as MPI libraries or, or drivers or user level drivers. But you, you need to understand that this is not going to be a portable solution beyond maybe a target or very specific architecture class. You can also build, conversely, a very portable container, right? And there's a lot of advantages of doing that, but 
you probably shouldn't expect that this is going to magically scale on, you know, petascale or exascale systems in the future here. So I want to walk through some examples of this really sort of trying to outline our state of practice here. So within Cori, for instance, we, you know, shifter is used pretty heavily and system specific libraries are needed within a given HPC container image to really take advantage of the Aries interconnect. Um, this is not a new system. Um, so what we do is we combine bind mounts with dynamic linking to inject optimized libraries. And really what we're doing is we're, in, we're borrowing from the host and inserting into our containerized environment, basically poking a hole through this container. Um, and you know the assumption or assertion is that our libraries are optimally configured in that sense. So it's sort of called container bypass for lack of a better term. And this is essentially what we do with MPitch based implementations. So that includes Cray MPI, Intel MPI, and obviously MPitch. We're relying fundamentally on the underlying ABI compatibility where I can hot swap a library. Um, and, and, you know, there's different methods for doing this, right? Replacing the library directly in my container and overwriting that part of the file system or just changing LD library path in a, in a different overlay. Um, and this has been used re re readily and heavily, um, but you could, you could see how this is start gonna, we could start to see some issues. You know, there's OpenMPI also works, um, can work in a similar way, right? You can take the container bypass model um, you can also custom build, you know, um, your open MPI to fit maybe borrowed from open HPC or to fit your specific HPC, you know, um, needs, right? Whether that's getting an IB version correct or building UCX or in PIMX directly in your container. Um, this requires detailed knowledge of your targeted system and is, is in no way going to be portable, but it can actually scale to 2000 plus nodes that we've seen, for instance, on Astra. Um, but this can be rather cumbersome for our custom containers. And the way in which we're sort of generating this is, is rather new. Um, so instead of going and building our containers, you know, on a individual laptop or something like that, we're actually trying to enable our um, users to build directly on the supercomputing resources. We would all love to have Docker existing on these systems, but you know, Docker is essentially a root level equivalent environment. So providing that along with a shared, re, you know, shared file system such as Lustre or GPFS is essentially a non-starter. So we've been working with um, Podman most recently and the associated Builda uh, and Scopio tools to really de uh, develop and prototype out an initial uh, rootless Podman solution. And you can see this workflow here where I on the login node can do a Podman build. This is essentially the same as a Docker build, right? They're, they're CLI equivalent. You can alias these even. Push to some local container registry service that's gonna store my containers. Um, and then I can use other container runtimes, such as Singularity, for instance, to pull that image down and go and run it at some significant scale. Um, you know, I'm showing an example here with our ATSI programming environment. We're now moving towards SPAC and gaining some of those features as well. Um, and we can build these OCI compliant images. Um, this is nice. This is really, really important for a lot of our, our use cases um, and our, our user base. However, you could quickly see, and it adds, but both as well as hinders some of our reproducibility efforts, right? I now have a centralized image registry where I can go months and years later, presumably, assuming nobody's deleted my container image, um, and go get the exact working environment that I expected that I ran, you know, six months or a year ago, right? But uh, this isn't a very portable solution. And what happens when the system disappears, right? There's big questions there. So HPC applications usually need specialized interconnects libraries not found in some base operating system, right? The typical solution requires mapping these libraries or custom building them inside your container which can cause either host to container incompatibilities. Um, there's different methodologies that we can leverage here, but you know, it really requires a lot of user level expertise, more than we think is necessary. And if portability is possible, users may not understand what the performance limitations are, which is a fundamental problem for HPC. So uh, one, one very uh, real uh, example of this is sort of with the container bypass problem. It, that, that we found is um, on the Cori system, for instance, with Shifter. Um, that's a Cray resource or HPE resource 
They've had, you know, container capabilities for years and they've gotten used to deploying their applications. Well, that system got upgraded to a new version of CLE, a Cray Linux environment. And with that brought in a new version of glibc. And boy, didn't that cause some issues when you started binding and um, bind mounting in new parts and libraries um, into an already existing container. And you immediately found a glibc mismatch and um, you know, full stop, end of story, your, your container is no longer going to run. This is the same machine, just two years apart, right? So there are limits <laughs> and real challenges to, to reproducibility. It's not as simple as actually going and you know, leveraging a container registry. That gets us some places and more than just, I built this in my home directory, right? And hoping, uh, you know, we have that expert level uh, ability to track, but there's, so the question is, what can we do about this? Um, and we, we've outlined sort of four potential options that um, I think are valuable, each in different contexts and um, really try to explore what the limitations of this are. So I'm gonna quickly walk through this. Um, one is sort of adding metadata to our image, which we're, 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 you know, calling custom image labels here. And we prototyped this initially, Shane and I, with Shifter. And the idea here is that in our Docker file, we can insert some label um, that, that identifies um, manually what we expect from a host that we get, right? So this is basically saying that I expect some glibc version or compatibility here in my container image. And I'm letting you know, I'm running an mpitch based container image and I'm not gonna be surprised if you swap this in. But if you meet these two requirements, um, you know, there's some notion that you could go and run this image. And this also self documents, right? So we're trying to manually insert this directly in the Docker files. Um, the, the, the problem is when you go and convert these to other things such as singularity, you may lose some of this metadata. Um, but we're still relying on container bypass mechanisms, and this requires actual, you know, extra work and manual work from the developer. Um, this may be something we can automate in the future, potentially with, you know, introspection of your given architecture, for instance, but this at least gets us moving along that path, I think. And I'd like to see a lot more sort of custom labeling of our images as we move forward. Um, you know, there's another option that, you know, we should just be building everything in our container all the time. Um, you know, that being said, our target our hardware may not be known in advance and it may change beneath our feet. Um, there's some notion that I could just, okay, if the architecture changes, if I have all the source code, I'll just rebuild, right? Just do a new, you know, uh, SPAC install and, and or, or whatever have you, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, make, make all, <laughs> make install. Um, there's limitations to this. First, we may not have all the all the software. You know, if you go and talk to you know vendors and proprietary you know um, HPC providers such as HPE or Cray, they they regard you know their optimizations as part of their software stack no different than Coca Cola you know regards its super secret recipe. Um, you know that this is this may be an intractable option. So you have a tough choice of ensuring that you're only going to have an open source, you know, dependency model if you want to go down this path. But there is some notion that you could potentially maybe not get bitwise reproducibility, but this could really enable, you know, that sort of experimental reproducibility if I know I have all the source code, right? At least potentially from a functional standpoint. So there's also a lot of talk and we've gone back and forth on maybe we should be creating a compatibility layer, right? That, that really says and steps in um, independent of what your container runtime is, sort of um, you know, makes directed decisions on how to do these bind mounts, when to poke holes in our container, right? As well as uh, managing you know, glibc issues or LD preload. Um, and this allows us to provide a common place for when we go do and go break these rules of, of, of you know, container bypass, it's done in a common framework in a common way. Um, maybe the container, you know, the CNI interface, the container network interface is the right approach. L there's live NVIDIA container, which takes this, but again, this is a vendor specific solution. Maybe what we need is, this is a good start, but we need to, uh, you know, expand this. Um, again, there's still some limits here. And this is sort of the opposite of having all the source code. 
There's also this notion that we can rely on system level virtualization. And this is a very attractive solution for me as I, you know, historically have been very interested in virtual machines and hypervisors. Um, and it's very much related to some of the, the work that I think Kate was just talking about. You know, we could leverage these cloud implementations, have multiple levels of abstraction, you know, layer our containers atop virtual machines, which, you know, is customized for the hardware that we're, we're we have. We can customize our kernel config and host environment to match the requirements, provide abstractions or emulations of hardware even if, if we wanted to and build that as part of an emulated driver set even. Um, th this may re require, you know, some significant infrastructure investment more than leadership class capability HPC has been willing to make thus far. Um, you know, I, I think Kate already touched on this and somewhat in the discussion, you know, can our domain scientists, you know, be able to tune and optimize and handle this much abstraction, right? Or are they going to feel like their hands are tied to some extent? And what performance considerations are we going to have to make um, as we really look at this? You know, it, it may not fit all of HPC. So there's, there's options. I, I'm excited about all of these, in fact, you know, I, um, I really think we have this ability to really enable some new portability and potentially new methods of reproducibility, but but we're not we're not there yet, and we've got a lot more work that we do because this is quickly becoming um, a very critical aspect, at least in the DOE and NSA space. Um, and at the same time, nobody wants to give up that that performance aspect, so we better come up with a solution that is that you know manages uh, you know everything in, in relation to one another. A, a simply reproducible solution in the context of HPC isn't going to work because performance is probably gonna be lost. And we, we can't do that. But there may be some, we need to as a community be able to make the, the trade-offs necessary um, really to make that happen. I, I, you know, I, I wanna have that conversation. And I think we need to be having that conversation a lot more. Um, you know, maybe container bypass isn't the right way to do this, but if we are gonna continue down this path, we better put some bookends and some bounds behind it to really make this a more ubiquitous solution that we, we've gotten away with thus far. Um, you know, and will more metadata, be it automated or manually labeling of our container images, will this really fix things? Are there other tie-ins we can make potentially into